Hello and welcome back to Funerals in the Rain. If you enjoy this channel, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and comment below. Welcome back to part two of Edgar Allan Poe's The Visionary Assignation. All efforts were in vain. Many of the most energetic in the search were relaxing their endeavors and yielding to a gloomy sorrow. There seemed but little hope for, this ch for the child, how much less than for the mother. But now from the dark niche, which has been before mentioned as a forming part of the old Republican prison, as fronting the Latisse of the Marchesa, a figure muffled in a cloak stepped and within reach of the light, and pausing a moment upon the verge of the giddy height, Plunged headlong into the canal, as in an instant afterwards, he stood with the still living and breathing child within his grasp. Upon the marble flagstones by the side of the Marchesa, his cloak, heavy with the water, became unfastened and failing in folds about his feet, discovered into the wonder-stricken spectators the graceful person of a very young man, with whose name the greater part of European of Europe was then ringing. No word spoke the stranger but the Marchesa. She will now live, receive her child. She will press it to her heart. She will cling to its little form and smother it with her caresses. Alas, another's arms have taken it away and borne it afar off and noticed into the palace and the Marchesa a tear is gathering into her eyes, those eyes which, like Pliny's own acanthus, are soft and almost liquid. Her lip, her beautiful lip, trembles. The entire woman thrills throughout the soul, and the statue has started into life. The pallor of the marble countenance, the swelling of the marble bosom, the very purity of the marble feet is suddenly flushed over with a tide of ungovernable crimson, and a slight shudder sh quivers about the entire frame, like a soft wind at Napoli, but the rich silver li lilies in the grass. Why should that lady blush? To this demand there is no answer, except that having left in the eager haste and terror of a mother's heart the privacy of her own boudoir, she has neglected to enthrall her feet in their tiny slippers and utterly forgotten to throw over her Venetian shoulders that drapery which is their due. What other possible cause could have been for her so blushing, for the glance of those large appealing eyes, for the unusual th tum tumult of that throbbing bosom, for the convulsive pressure of that trembling hand, that hand which fell as Mentoni turned in the palace, Accidentally upon the hand of the stranger, what reason could there have been for the low, the singularly low tone of those unmeaning words which the lady uttered hurriedly in, de, in bidding him adieu? Thou hast conquered, she said, for the murmurs of the water deceived me. Thou hast conquered. One hour after sunrise we shall meet, so let it be. The tumult has subsided, the lights had died away within the piazza, and the stranger whom I now recognized stood alone upon the flags. He shook with inconceivable agitation, and his eyes glanced round in search of a gondola. I could do no less than offer him the service of my own. In a hurried manner, he accepted my civility. An oar was obtained as the water gate, and as we passed together to his residence, he rapidly recovered his self-possession and spoke of our former slight acquaintance in terms of great apparent cordiality. There are some subjects upon which I take pleasure in being minute. The person of the stranger, let me call him by that title, who to all the world was still a stranger. The person of the stranger is one of these subjects. In height, he might have been below rather than above the medium size, although there were moments of intense passion when his frame actually expanded and belied the asser assertion, like almost slender symmetry of his figure, promised more of the ready activity which he evinced the, at the bridge of size than the Herculean strength which he had been known to wield without an effort upon occasions of more dangerous 
emergency with the mouth of chin and chin of a deity, a nose like those delicate cre creations of the mind to be found only in the medallions of the Hebrew, Hebrew full eyes whose shadows varied from pure hazel to intense and brilliant jet and a profusion of glossy black hair from which a forehead rather low than otherwise gleamed forth at intervals of light and ivory. His were features then which I have seen none more classically regular except perhaps the marble ones of the Emperor Commodus. Yet his countenance was nevertheless one of those which all men have seen at some period of their lives and have never afterwards seen again. It ha had no peculiar, I wish to be perfectly understood, no settled predominant expression to be fastened upon the memory, a countenance seen and instantly forgotten, but forgotten with a vague, intense, and never-ceasing desire of recalling it to mind, not that the spirit of each rapid passion failed at any time to throw its own distinct image upon the mirror of that face, but that mirror, mirror, like, retained no vestige of the passion when the passion has departed. Thank you for watching this video, and stay tuned for part three of Edgar Allan Poe's The Visionary, The Assignation.